So it's 11 a.m. in the morning in uh, Central Europe, in Germany and in Belgium. Uh, welcome to this webinar. This webinar is in English, uh, but for all our German uh, speaking attendees, if you have questions, you can ask them in German and I will translate them. And we have a packed webinar today. So I saw, <laughs> I saw the slides we have. So uh, I think this uh, webinar is all uh, presentation and the BNI decided to add another webinar on the 31st of January, again a Friday, when we do a demo and a Q&A session. But if you, have, if you have questions, don't be shy, ask them and we try to fit them in. So, good morning, alle aus Deutschland. Ich hoffe, ihr könnt unser Englisch verstehen. Wenn ihr Fragen habt, ihr könnt die durchaus in Deutsch formulieren. Ich werde die dann übersetzen. Ähm, Didier versteht auch ein bisschen Deutsch. Er ist da zwar sehr schüchtern, aber wir haben auch englische Teile. So, Didier, let's start. Didier and I, um, uh, first let's do a little bit of an introduction. Everybody of you who don't know the Hyper-V Amigos, that's Didier and I. And we do show cards. And um, in the last, uh, I think, three, three, four months, we did a lot of backup uh, stuff uh, with our favorite backup vendor, Veeam. But this, this webinar is not Veeam only. It's general about Hyper-V backup. Uh, and I will give over the screen to Didier. And Didier, you will start the presentation, right? And maybe you introduce yourself. Yes. Uh, hello. So I'm, I'm Didier. As you all know by now, so let's just uh, continue with the presentation now. And here's a slide deck with some information where you can find my blog, my Twitter. I will not go into that. The picture is of me in my fur favorite place, hiking around in the Pacific Northwest. And I have a friend over there, and I took his poster to make people aware of forest fires and turned it into a backup poster. So it is only you that can prevent data loss. So that's why you do backups. That's why we are here today. Uh, when you do backups, you want to do them for a reason. That's to protect your business. So if you make a statement like, uh, you know, if you have a backup plan, you've admitted you're not going to succeed. In some contexts, that might be true, but in many contexts, that goes horribly wrong. And normally for American audiences who know this lady and the company she had, uh, that makes uh, for a good joke, actually. But for European audiences, I've noticed they don't always know what's going on here. But Google her and you'll have a good laugh. But there's a serious side to this. Uh, you all might remember the company Marsk and many others that were hit by NotPetya. And that's uh, not even ransomware, that's a wiper. So that basically just destroys your company. And that's what uh, it looks like in real life. This happens to be a grocery store, but it can also happen to hospitals, banks, your business. Whatever, big and small, this is the reality. It is total and utter chaos. It's not a pretty picture. Of course, there's always the natural uh, disasters. They do occur, and they don't seem to be reduced in uh, in frequency and size uh, the last uh, decade. So be ready for that. Hardware, whatever it is, whatever component, it can fail, it will break. So also, you need to protect against that. And then something that still a lot of people seem to miss, your hardworking colleagues in your business, they're very diligent, they're very intelligent, they work very hard, but they are human. Hence, they make a mistake sometimes. They can delete data by accident, they can corrupt data by accident. So that's also something you need to protect against. And it's even worse, you have a special type of colleagues, your IT professionals, your developers that have the tools and the skill set to actually destroy data or corrupt data a lot quicker. So these people, sometimes need extra attention. So to set the scene, as we're talking about Hyper-V backups, this is, let's say, how Hyper-V looked like in, from the start 2008 to 2011, right? You had a cluster, uh, a cluster has shared storage, a SAM, and on the Hyper-V nodes, you were running some VMs. That's basically what it looks like. In that era, you normally deploy the backup agent manually, automatically, it doesn't really matter, but you had to deploy one to every host. And then you choose to select a VM to backup. When that happens, uh, at the end of everything that is done to the VM, a snapshot has to be created. Now that snapshot can be a Windows native a software snapshot, or it could be a hardware integrated snapshot. And then that snapshot has to be mounted and the data copied off to your backup repository. And in short, that's a Windows backup, uh, a Hyper-V backup. Now, 
Sounds easy enough, but you had this dependency on agents on every host, uh, and in some cases, for some workloads, even in VMs. You had the VSS framework, not just inside of each VMs, which is normal because you want an application consistent backups most of the time, but also on the host. So in a worst case scenario, if you have a VM with four disks and those four disks, for example, uh, a SQL Server database were spread across multiple LUNs because that's what people did. They just copied the physical world to the virtual world. Uh, that would mean that for one Hyper-V uh, virtual machine backup, you would have four volume snapshots on each of those volumes. And no matter what, if there were 30 VMs on that volume, you were backing up just one, the host uh, VSS snapshot is for that entire volume. It, it can't exclude things that are on there. So that's a lot of overhead for just one VM. As said, such a snapshot has to be mounted so you can copy off the data. And what we saw in those days is that the scalability, the reliability, and the performance of all this, especially at scale, wasn't always what we expected or desired. So we started doing tricks. We started playing with hardware VSS providers to make that host snapshot a lot more efficient, to be able to leverage that uh, uh, hardware VSS snapshot and mount it on another server, so the off-host proxies. But all that impacts virtual machine mobility. And the nice thing about virtualization is that you can move virtual machines around for maintenance, for load balancing, etc. cetera. Uh, on top of that, uh, change block tracking still had to be invented, so to speak. Uh, so we were copying a lot of data unnecessarily, things that we had backupped already and hadn't changed. And then we had to start doing uh, deduplication, uh, either in line or on the archive storage. We had to work around the limitations of basically of what backups could do for us. And, yep, well, I'm going the wrong way here. So we've mentioned VSS, and normally when I mention VSS to people and ask if they have any concerns about it, that's about the look I get. I get this blank stare from somebody who has, who has actually worked with them. And if you have worked with them over a period of time, you must have run into some issues. Now, not to say that VSS is bad, because it is a very nice framework to create application consistent backups. And this is the eye chart they will show you if you are, let's say, a layman. If you if you want a high level overview of how it works, this is it. So don't even imagine what's under the hood. But actually, this is being implemented on, in, inside of the virtual machines, but also on every Hyper-V host. So the more you use this, the more opportunity you have, so to speak, to for something to go wrong. So how do we fix that? Well, let's take a look at what happens. Uh, if you look at uh, the VSS writers on a host, you will see a couple of uh, writers that are very important to Hyper-V. The Microsoft Hyper-V VSS writer, of course, and the clustered shared volume VSS writer. Now, if the Hyper-V VSS writer goes into an error state, normally you can resolve it by restarting the Hyper-V management service. And so that's not too bad. But if the clustered shared volume VSS writer is uh, in a non retriable error, you need to reboot the host. Of course, you have live migration, you can uh, evacuate the workload and not suffer downtime, but it's a bit of a tedious job to do. And if you have cluster shared volumes issues multiple times a week, you become, to say the least, a bit less enthusiastic about the process. So to understand what Hyper-V backups looked like in the early days and what they look like now, we are going to use a couple of images. And this is the one I'm going to explain in the most detail, because the other ones are just to focus on what has changed to improve things. So what did it look like in 2008 or 2012? Your backup software, which is the VSS requester, on the Hyper-V host, actually talks to the frame, VSS framework on that host, which in its turn talks to the Hyper-V writer that we just looked at, by the way, on that host, which talks to the VSS Hyper-V integration components inside of the virtual machine. And then it can talk to the VSS framework in the guest. So as you really? can see, Sorry. Really? yes, can you use your mouse that we see where oh, yeah. you are. Okay, that would be nice. I Thank will you. do that. Yeah. I was pointing, which is not a good idea, of course. <laughs> uh, so we are already using the VSS uh, framework on the host and in the guest. 
the VSS framework in the guest then talks to the VSS writers. It will list all the applications that are running inside of that VM. It will quiz them to make them into a state that they can be backed up application consistently. So inside of the guest, there is a guest snapshot being created by the VSS provider in the guest. When that's done, that is signaled to those integration components, which talks to the Hyper-V writer on the host, which will then tell the host VSS framework, hey, I'm done with this VM. At that moment, you can create the software or the hardware VSS provider host snapshot, which results in a snapshot, of course, that, well, what's happened? Between the time that you created a snapshot in the guest and the snapshot you make on the host, some time has expired. So basically, they are a little bit different. So what then has to happen is you have to revert any changes so they are alike. For that to happen, they actually had to mount every VHDX in the host snapshot to that host so that the uh, changes that were not completed could be rolled back. So imagine this is this slide talks about one VM, but what if you're backing up 10 VMs in a job or 20 VMs in a job or all VMs on a, on a CSV? This process has to happen for every VM and for every virtual disk on that VM. So that becomes quite an effort that is being host, uh, mounted on the host, the changes reverted, and then dismounted again. And of course, you once you've done that, you can close that snapshot. It becomes read-only, read -only, and you archive your backups to your backup repository. Now at that era, there were almost no uh, change block tracking mechanisms unless your backup vendor uh, offered them to you. And some did, some some uh, did not. So that's the state where you are where, where you're at. And you can see the problem with this. There is a lot of work going on uh, with those snapshots that are error prone and time consuming. There's a lot of overhead. So that's basically the story we talked about, and it's written down here for your reference, but we're not gonna read it out loud. That's what I just told you. But it's always nice to be able to give people some, some uh, background information. Now, Microsoft, of course, realized this, and they came up with a better plan for 2012 R2. And if you did not want to move to 2012 R2 back in the day, at least improved backups were uh, a very good reason to do so. So we'll walk through it again, but a bit in less detail, we'll, we'll focus on the differences. So what you can see here is your VSS requester, backup software, talks to the host VSS framework, talks to the Hyper-V writer on the host. There's something different here already. This generates the, the AVHDX grids you will use in the backup process because you need to know them in advance. So actually this is being done over here, but then it's pretty much the same. It talks to the VSS integration components inside of the guest, which in its split turn talks to the VSS framework in the guest. And again, we go to the writers, which list all your applications in your VM to in order to create a consistent uh, guest snapshot. But now there is a big difference. If you look inside of uh, VM in 2012 R2 or later, you will see this little component, the Hyper-V IC Software Shadow Copy Provider. And basically this plays a provider like uh, a hardware VSS provider would. So the snapshot that's being created is not being created in uh, the, the running disk of the OS or, or the data, it is actually being created in its own little disk. So basically, Hyper-V is playing hardware VSS provider, but hence, as it is a virtualized environment, that hardware snatch, snapshot becomes a Hyper-V checkpoint a disk. That's the big difference. After that, things are as they used to be. The snapshot is ready. That is being notified to the host, to the writer, which again talks to the VSS framework, which knows that now is the time to create the host-based VSS snapshot. And again, this can be native Windows software or integration with your storage vendor. Again, we have the problem. Something uh, changed between the time you created the snapshot in the guest and 
the time you created the snapshot on the host of the LAN where that VM lives with its disks. So instead now of mounting every VHDX out of the snapshot on the host itself, well, we know that the guest snapshot resides in a specialized uh, AVHDX. So we can mount, we can use that and mount the disk and revert the changes actually inside of the virtual machine. But to, but to, to be able to mount a VHDX live to uh, uh, a virtual machine, you need an iSCSI controller. Uh, sorry, a SCSI controller. So that's why people who were very uh, performance uh, based or focused in those days, sometimes they removed uh, IDE drives. Uh, sorry, IDE controllers. And then you could have a problem with a generation two VM because there was no, sorry, with a generation one VM that you could not mount uh, a disk. So the, the SCSI controller has to be there, right? Uh, I'm, 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 uh, I'm messing this up. They removed the, the, the SCSI controllers. So then there was nothing to mount that disk to. So that was an error we ran into in that, in that era. But the big difference here, what made so much difference in reliability and in performance and in scalability is the fact that you could do the entire auto recovery process. And that's why you see that auto recovery AVHDX uh, if you do backups in 2012 R2. That's what made it so much better. Instead of having to mount those files to the host itself to do the reverting, it is now taken care of inside of the virtual machine. And that's the big difference. Lydia, we have a question. Yes. Um, the question is from Soran. Must VMs for this scenario be on Windows Server 2012 R2? Yes, they must. Uh, you mean, the, the, you mean the, the, the guest operating system or the, the host? I think Soran means the host. So uh, this scenario is only available guest OS. Soran uh, added oh, no, that's guest okay. OS. That's okay. It's okay. It can be 2012 or 2012 R eight. It's it's a pure Hyper V mechanism here. Yeah. So sorry, the guest can be now, um, now, now, now with this, but with only this Windows. Uh, yes, but with this little with this little remark, uh, there are operating systems, of course, that are not supported. So then all deals are off. It might work. It might not work. I will not go into that. But every Hyper V version has a, a list of supported guest operating systems. Mm -hmm. It has to be in that list, right? Yeah, and in the 2012 are two days, still 2003 was supported. Yeah. 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 And, of okay, course, uh, what, and of course, the backups we're talking about here are the most rich backups, the application consistent ones. There are other uh, levels of backup consistency, file consistency or crash consistent, which work fine for Linux, for example, the file consistent ones or the crash consistent ones just as well. But we are talking now about the most rich, most uh, enhanced backup experience, right? Application consistent. So please go on. So that part has been vastly improved. Again, the, snap, the snapshot has to be mounted. So you copy the data to your backup repository. And if your vendor offers it, like Veeam does, or was very early implementer of this, you had uh, change block tracking, which makes a huge difference because you don't copy bits unneeded, unnecessary because you've already have them. So this is the good stuff. But still, uh, things were not perfect. Uh, one small hiccup that people saw, we've already mentioned that you have to have the SCSI controller to be able to mount that uh, virtual disk to do the, revert, the auto recovery phase. But uh, it also led to people having some, uh, let's say, scary moments in their life. Especially developers, when they were looking at some of their servers, they every day or multiple times a day they saw there's a disk being removed. Well, that's basically yes, there is. You are attaching a disk. It has the same disk signature as your original disk, and it gets removed because well, it's just for the auto recovery phase. So that's something you had to learn and live with. There were some attempts to subdue these messages uh, when they were used for backups, but in reality, I still see them happening. Right, so that hasn't really worked out, but it's okay. As long as you know this, there is no problem there. And then the process I explained is here written down for you as a reference. We'll not talk about it. But still, in that uh, time frame, things had improved. We had better scalability, we had better reliability, we had better performance, but it still could be better. 
why we still had these issues with VSS snapshots sometimes going AWOL, going wrong. Uh, it's a complex system. And uh, trying to mount uh, snapshots on off-host proxies, uh, sometimes that works very well. It depends a bit on the quality of your storage environment and your network. Uh, but it's not a panacea for most people or for many people. So uh, it, it adds an extra level of uh, infrastructure you need to manage, and that needs to function well. And then the, the backup agents, uh, while perhaps not the worst problem because a lot of the backup vendors had nice uh, ways of updating and installing the agents for you so you didn't have to worry about it. Uh, it is a kernel mode driver in there, so that means that Microsoft isn't always happy. Right? They, they like to avoid things in the kernel. They don't like it because if you cause a blue screen, they get the bad rap, and et cetera, et cetera. It also means that every backup vendor has to create one themselves, which means that they all have to test it. So if you wouldn't need backup agents, that would be a very a big improvement in terms of testing and releasing new software because you, that part has gone. That would be nice. And the world was changing. Uh, you had different types of storage and different types of storage from SANS, local, hyperconverged, converged, uh, file shares even. So a lot of things changed and a lot of companies got a lot more uh, heterogeneous when it comes to storage. There was no longer one single type of storage. And once you know how to back up with that well, you were done. No, you are, now you have to do it for two, three, four, potentially five systems. Uh, the guest cluster support was all, was never really good. It, it didn't exist natively for Microsoft. And the entire backup process still has a lot of impact on virtual machine mobility because when you move a virtual machine uh, that is living on a CSV uh, to another host and you are creating hardware snapshots and you want to do the backup, they don't really like that. Uh, also, a lot of the backup uh, vendors in combination with SAN storage would uh, sometimes even require you that the, mach the virtual machine was al always running on the CSV and the host where you created the backup uh, job, which is kind of limiting uh, and you see that you saw that more or you still see that more with storage vendor based backup solutions than with third party backup uh, vendors. One, one short ask to you, yeah. can you go back to the slides where you uh, showed the whole process and stay there for two, for two or three seconds? Here we go, Pick this one. The next one and the next one. The next one, this one, no. Yeah. The, the the first one of these, yeah, thank you. And then you now you can go to the second one. Because the people don't get the slides, they only have the video recording. And they can ah, okay. The otherwise, okay. Otherwise, we can we can do a little follow up uh, about, with the links, and that will be okay. For you it is, but for me it's a lot of work. Yeah, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So, scalability-wise, well, the number of VMs keeps increasing, and the number of disks or, or LUNs you use keep increasing, and then you need to do more back backups. And parallel backups were not always going that well with host host-based uh, VSS snapshots. And then there was the amount of volume-level snapshots you needed to do. You know, we already said even if you only back up one VM with one disk, that's still an entire host LUN uh, volume snapshot. What if you have VMs with multiple disks over multiple host LUNs that only increases? And it has to do that for every single VM. And in the beginning, backup software was rather stupid, so to speak. You, you could create a job with 10 backups and it would do that entire process VM per VM. Later on, they, they introduced the ability to have one host snapshot for multiple VMs, but in the beginning, that was like, okay, every single VM on the same volume, and still you were doing as many snapshots as you had uh, VMs on that disk, which was a bit crazy. And then the space overhead, the change block tracking, if your backup software doesn't offer that, that was also a scalability issue because you need a lot of backup storage. And all that work, all that extra work you have to do, 
uh, has an impact on your production fabric, your workloads, because it's resource consuming, uh, both on the network or the, or the, the fabric, so it could be FC, iSCSI, whatever you're using, and on your native workloads that are running on those Hyper-V servers, hence the popularity of off-host proxies. The duration of the backup is also a concern because the more you have to back up, well, your, your backup window shrinks. And people started becoming a bit more paranoid and they were going, uh, I'll back up a day isn't enough anymore. I want two per day or three per day or even one per hour, depending on your work uh, loads. So that's all the challenges that were there. And those challenges were the same, basically, if you were talking to clients or to consultants or to backup companies, everybody was feeling this. So Microsoft uh, also had a very interesting, uh, let's say, use case to improve their backups. Uh, they had a little... A uh, project going on. It's called Azure, and when you come to a certain level of public cloud scale uh, performance and scalability, that becomes a huge thing. So they had they had to feel their own pain there. So they so they most certainly decided to do something about it, right? So they were thinking about this, and they said, okay, everything we need to do a backup is actually available. In our hypervisor, so how can we how can we get rid of everything we do not need? So basically, what they did, they went agentless, and that means that they were creating WMI, WMI APIs that you could access remotely, and that's where where a backup software can talk to to create backups. So that means there is no reason or no mandatory reason to install code on a host. Secondly, they implemented native change block tracking. So your hardware, your backup vendor does not have to deliver that. They can use the native system that's available with Hyper-V. So those drivers are gone as well. Then for st to be storage efficient, well, you already have the change block tracking that helps. Uh, so that uh, helps to reduce the space you need to 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 store your backups, but you can also reduce uh, perhaps the overhead or the cost of doing the duplication. And it also reduces the I.O. overhead during the backups. Uh, it, it reduces the time, so it becomes more performant. It scales better. And because you are taking out the host VSS snapshot out of this, it becomes more reliable. Uh, I've written a couple of articles on that a couple of years ago. The links are on there. I will leave the slide here so you can now take screenshots or go back to the video later, but that's what they did. And that's what our next uh, discussion topic is about. So the need for change block tracking, we've talked about it. Without it, it is uh, yeah a lot of time you're wasting, copying too much data. It incurs resource overheads on your fabrics and your hosts. Uh, you have to come up with off-host proxies to deal with it, for example. That is an extra cost, an extra complexity you need to manage. Every vendor implemented or didn't implement actually their own change block tracking mechanism. That means it has to be tested. New drivers, new versions, new updates from Windows. There's always a risk something goes wrong. Uh, every new OS release, retesting, re-certification, etc. for every single backup vendor. And then if you have power failures and VM mobility scenarios, well, change block tracking in memory is very fast and very good. But you might want to deal with other scenarios and virtual virtual VM mobility, especially. Well, that's that's the beauty of virtualization that you can move VMs around. And if that breaks your change block tracking, well, that's not a very good story. So they had to deal with that as well. So what did they come up with? Finally, they came up with two files. So you have resilient change tracking, which means that they actually have a write cache there. So it's performant, and it's uh, very granular, which allows your VMs to move. So right, live migration, storage live migration. If you move a VM, those files move with them, so you still have your change block tracking. The, 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 the downside of this is that the write cache makes it performant, and you can have very small uh, deltas in there, but it comes at a performance cost. It's, 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 uh, the cost of performance is that if you disable the write cache, for example, to make sure that everything is written to the disk, well, then you have a performance issue. So they were at, in the beta versions, they had only had RCT. 
so they ran into an issue, so they split it up. So you have the RCT that are pure wide cache, very small deltas for the VM mobility, but they have a second one. Those are the, uh, the modifiable range tracking files, and they are in write through. So they, these are the ones that have a, a performance impact, but they are not as granular. But they are meant to protect you against a sudden power loss or blue screen of death. So even if you have a server that crashes, the VMs on there don't lose their change block tracking, not completely. So if you put that in a picture and you look at uh, changes, so what you will see is that in memory, the granularity is the smallest, right? This is the best you can get. But that only works within a host as long as the VM stays on that host. Now, if you do a live migration, you use the, the RCT files. So the granularity is a bit bigger, but still it's pretty decent. And the performance is good because it's cached. Now, if you use the MRT files, the granularity is a lot bigger, but you are in write through, so the performance is worse. So that's why you lose the granularity to make sure that the performance impact isn't that big. Which means, if you look at a, at, a, at a reason to use a change block tracking file, well, I have a live migration, then I fall back to RCT. I have a power failure, I fall, fall back to MRT. But still, you have change block tracking in all those scenarios, which is quite nice. That's, uh, that's a good thing to have. Now, there, there are some issues that, are, that were reported with uh, change block tracking in combination with some of the spectre mitigations in, in the CPUs. And as far as I understood, that's a concern that is being addressed uh, somewhere this year. And it's I've only heard and seen about, or, or that's talked about it with some people in certain scenarios. So it's not a, a wholesale massive impact that, uh, all over the world with every single backup, but it is out there. But it's good to know it's being addressed. Then they also invented something new to make all the other goodies possible, and it's called uh, recovery checkpoints. As you might remember, until 2016, we only had standard checkpoints, which were basically checkpoints that captured the memory state of a virtual machine. There was no application consistency there. Some applications really could not handle that well. For some, it wasn't that bad. If you did that live on a domain controller, that was not a very good idea to do so. But they introduced something that was called production checkpoints, which actually leverages the VSS framework, and you have an, uh, an application consistent uh, checkpoint. Now, you can use these as an administrator in your Hyper-V console or in a PowerShell, but there are also leveraged, well, special versions of those inside of the Hyper-V for backups and uh, replication. And these are called recovery checkpoint. A recovery checkpoint is something that's created with code, with WMI calls. It's not something you can do as an administrator, as a one-off. That's not how, what, they, what they are used for. They have the defined consistency level of application consistent, file system consistent, and crash consistent. So you can have multiple use cases, multiple scenarios. It works for Linux, et cetera. And then they introduce something that are called reference points. These are necessary to point to those MRT and, and CRT files so you can have efficient incremental uh, backups. It's basically a pointer to a known state in time. And the nice thing about Veeam is that when you're doing a backup, you actually see what they are using, whether it's a normal uh, uh, a standard checkpoint or recovery checkpoint. It's written in there. And it's, I think it's the only software I've seen where they, where they actually show what checkpoint they're using. So that's what you're seeing here. But this is very important for the new uh, capabilities because now you have this ability to create differential exports. Why? Because, well, you want to be able to, to only copy off the data that has changed, right? To make it all more efficient. So how do you do that? Well, we already have checkpoints in, uh, in Hyper-V. Well, make a differential export functionality for it and you have your efficient archival or backup of the data. Of course, you also need to manage virtual machine IDs. If you if you restore a virtual machine, you might want to restore it with the same virtual machine ID, so everything uh, from monitoring software to whatever is, uh, is is still working and knows and realizes it's the same virtual machine. If you restore a virtual machine with a different ID, for every product that is you managing, monitoring that VM, it's a new VM, so something might break, so you don't want that. So 
This all allows also for synthetic operation on the side of the backup uh, uh, vendor, because they know what a differential export is. They know what that there is data in there that is the difference between what they already have and the latest backup. So what can you do with that? You can create synthetic full backups. You can do backup maintenance, expire backup data, and uh, add the newest uh, backups into perhaps a synthetic backup or whatever. So the synthetic actions that you have, have become used to from your backup vendors, they work with this system. So you, yes. you don't lose any, yes? We have a question about uh, the performance with RCT and MRT. So there is some concern um, about the performance with MRT. You, you said they are right in right through mode, so we have no caching here. Yeah. Um, but they are larger files, so we, we shouldn't have a too big uh, performance. Impact. Yeah, so it's less frequent and the deltas are a lot bigger. So it doesn't happen as often as with, a, with an RCT, but they are they are both used, right? Uh, the, the, the biggest concern at the moment is that there are some scenarios, apparently, where depending on uh, your BIOS uh, fix for Spectre and other CPU vulnerability mitigations, uh, and in combination with how much of that you have actually activated in your host on Windows, uh, via the registry keys, that it might have some impact. And some people have seen this. And as far as I know, this should be fixed somewhere this year. And I'm hoping for Q1. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'll give you an example. I have, I have, I have not yet seen an environment that I take care of where I have seen the issue. Mm -hmm. So as as far as I know, it exists. But I personally haven't seen it. And I only know a couple of people around the globe that have seen it. So it's not and that so, widespread. So this yeah, is not just to be clear. Uh, if you have uh, VHDX where the M is writing uh, data to, it's also in the right stream mode. So we don't have caching here either, except the storage system has some flash, yeah, uh, store, sure. uh, flash cache. Uh, so it's not unusual to use in a virtualization environment a write through mode and uh, don't allow caching of the data because they are too. No, no, it, and it, it really has something to do. The, with, the, with all those mitigations and the fact that yeah. they can that they can fix it uh, shows you that this is not something that you can cannot uh, uh, solve, right? Mm. I, I'm just sure. being completely open and honest because I'm saying it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is not ugly. This is a bit bad if you happen to run into it. But the good news is it's being fixed. True. So please go. So we've talked about the synthetic actions, and I am assuming here in this uh, presentation that people have worked with backups before. This is not an introduction to backups, so I'll, I'll assume that you know what I mean with all these synthetic actions. So now we have a new picture, and that picture is for 2016 and 2019 today as well. So again, we have our backup software, which is the VSS requester on the host, and now it talks to Hyper-V WMI. So that Hyper-V uh, VSS framework for the moment to create a backup is gone. That talks to the integration components inside of the virtual machine, which then talks to the VSS framework in the guest and to the Hyper-V writers because you want an application consistent snapshot. Then you get a software VSS provider guest snapshot inside of the guest. And this is pretty similar to what you know. Now, you still have your Shadow copy provider, you can, it still creates AVGXs during your backup. You can see those. It will talk to the Hyper-V integration components that it's done, which lets Hyper-V WMI know. And now you have two options, right? Your backup software is either configured to, well, not use Hyper-V hosts uh, VSS framework anymore, or you still leverage it. If you have a SAN, you might still choose to do uh, to leverage the VSS framework on the host to create a hardware snapshot that you can mount on an off-host proxy. But if you are, for example, running hyper-converged scenarios where you don't have snapshots that integrate with backups, why would you? And why would you even do that host snapshot? You don't need to anymore in 2016. So that's the green part. This is the optimal part. You have your AVGXs. The recovery checkpoints are already uh, consistent, so that problem of that there has some time, there was some time between your guest snapshot and your host snapshot. Well, there is no host snapshot. You're done. You can export, uh, archive it to the uh, to the to the backup storage. 
you export your uh, your uh, your, uh, your reference IDs, you have to keep them. Those are actually stored in the VMCX files of your virtual machine. So once you've done your export, so to speak, you convert that that checkpoint to reference point, and then this can be removed. This is done. This is where you keep hey. What is going on? How do I have a full backup? What is my next backup? So basically, these are reference uh, IDs to points in time of a, of a known state of data, which are persisted on your backup repository. And of course, your backup software knows how to handle this. But that has made a tremendous uh, improvement in the reliability and scalability of backups. And it has also made sure that even if you don't have uh, storage arrays that can leverage hardware VSS providers, that you can still have very performance uh, backups. And that's important. It's important for S2D HCI. It's important for a lot of HCI uh, solutions. It's important for uh, file share storage if you use that in a, in a converged scenario. So that makes uh, a huge difference. But still, if you have SANS and you like SANS, even then the scenario is improved. Because, because everything you do for the guest backup is taken care of by Hyper-V, the only thing you need to do is create that Hyper-V snapshot, uh, sorry, that, that host uh, snapshot, whether that's a software one or uh, a hardware one, but, it, but in, in reality, since 2016, the only things you are going to use it for is hardware VSS snapshots, because then you can move that or mount that uh, snapshot on another host and back up it to your backup repository from there, which makes sure that the CPU load and the network load is not going to your Hyper-V host. It's a dedicated machine for that purpose. So depending on your environment, that's still very useful, but you need a SAN for it with a hardware VSS provider because only hardware snapshots are transportable. The software ones are not. And that has... Uh, increased in performance as well because i can actually now time it with a with a stopwatch i know my hardware snapshot takes 21 seconds almost always of every backup sometimes it's a bit longer but not more and if it takes four minutes i know something has gone very wrong but I, it's like it's it's very predictable now and it's very fast so san or no san doesn't really matter the improvements are there so what's gone here, the agents are gone. You have native change block tracking. Uh, you don't need your software, your backup software vendor to implement that anymore. So the entire process is actually pretty slick and it's never been this good. And really, I mean this, if people are still on 2012 R2 Hyper-V, if you, if you need one reason to upgrade, it is backups. Your life will be so much easier and better that I would say that's the only reason you need. So if you look at Veeam, we've already showed a small, yeah, the recovery checkpoint, you can actually see that's happening if you're leveraging it. If you look at a VM uh, that is being backed up by software that is uh, that supports 2016, 2019 and leverages the new functional functionality of Hyper-V, you will not ever see one disk uh, surprise remove again after a backup. However, sometimes you will, but that means that the backup software works with 2016 or 2019, not that it supports the new way of working. So I've seen this with uh, storage vendor-based backup solutions. It's, it's, uh, it's supported with 2016 and 2019, but they haven't changed the way they, they work. They still do the backups as they always done it. So you still see that this surprise move. So they actually they do a lot more work than they need to. So that's a bit sad. Sometimes you see this. So if you see this on 2016 or 2019 with your with your backup solution, you know they should do something and work to upgrade it. As I said, if you love your SAN and you love your SAN integration, because you can also do backups where the snapshots of the SAN are actually the, the, the backup copy, or you can use off-host proxies. Uh, there's only one caveat with that. If you use SAN integration for your backups, where you leave the backups as a snapshot on the SAN, you have to have a secondary copy. Because we all know if your SAN is toast, well, your backup copies are also toast because they stand snapshots on that same SAN. So you have to export them, you have to replicate them, 
uh, somehow. You have to have a second copy somewhere if you do that. Why would you do that? Speed and capacity, right? If you start doing backups every 15 minutes, like in some finan financial transaction software or sales software, you do this for the speed. But then uh, asynchronous, asynchronously, you will have a secondary copy or replication at least to make sure that you have multiple copies. Otherwise, it's a bit of a risky game. But again, you can leverage all those functionalities. And actually, this is a screenshot of uh, a compellent sand doing exactly that. It is creating a hardware uh, snapshot. It is importing it on an off-host proxy. So all the backups are actually done from that proxy, and there is no more IO load on the Hyper-V host. It just goes to the SAN. So that's a screenshot of that. So how are we on time, Karsten? Karsten? Yes, I have to unmute myself. So we have ah. 15 minutes to go. So I, yeah. I and have... we can take a little bit more time because the attendees are used that I uh, take a little bit over time, but roughly 15 to 20 minutes. Yeah, but I'm, I think I'm going to skip over the details. Uh, it's, it's actually going through the entire process, uh, and I might spend more time on the issues we still have, because that, for many people, is perhaps a bit more useful than going through the, the details of the process. So well, let's let do that. Just, let, let me just ask the, the people okay. in the webinar, do you want to see, who wants to see uh, uh, the details here and maybe less issues, or who wants to focus on issues? Kirill, a yes is not a good answer to my question. <laughs> it's an all question. Detail, okay, detail, detail. <laughs> but that issue, issue, detail, issue, everything. <laughs> I want, they want everything. Detail, well, everything is impossible. Issue, 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 detail. So, okay, you, uh, all people in the webinar, you know we will take some overtime then. And if you have to go drop out of the webinar, uh, there is always a recording. The recording uh, is running. So, um, did you go to detail and to then to the issues? So, you think what, a half an hour would be enough? Because we, we will do a Q&A session. Probably not. <laughs> Probably. So but, then, but I'll speed it up but, a bit. But at least I'll give them some detail, right? Uh, so, oh, okay, we, a backup, a backup. You have a production environment, very basically a running virtual machine, and it has a VHD. So what do you do? You create your checkpoint, right? So everybody who uses Hyper-V or virtual, virtualization knows this. You have an AVHD index now and, and your, your, your snapshot, your checkpoint. That's time one. Okay, what do you need to do to create a backup? You need to export your configuration so you know what the machine should look like when you restore it, and you need the data. So, well, the base VHD on T1, you just created a recovery checkpoint, you have it, just copy it over. Basically, that is what's happening during a backup. What is then done is that uh, checkpoint is deleted, but the reference point in your VMCX, your configuration file, refers to an RCT ID, and that RCT ID, well, that exists, right? You have that. Okay, so that's that's basically a backup. And as with all checkpoints you delete, there's the merging and it's gone. Now, if you want to do a backup, and you already have a full backup, well, it's going to be a differential one or an incremental one. So again, this is the situation we left you with after the first full backup, you keep the second backup. This is time to the, the second checkpoint. You still have these references to the RCID, and what happens now? Well, again, you copy off the data, right? But the good news is you can copy the difference, the differential VHDX. That means that you don't have to copy all the data. Why can you do that? Well, because you have reference IDs. You, you know what you know what data you already have. So that's what's happening. Then it's the same game that physical uh, checkpoint is going to be deleted, but you'll have a reference point, which again refers to an RCT, RCT ID. Fine. And that process repeats itself. So what if you, if you want to, well, software after a time, uh, backups expire. So you can get rid of uh, the backups, uh, the storage in the backup uh, system, but you can also have to get rid of the RCT IDs because they no longer need it. So yes, 
you can delete all their reference points and then this one becomes your point of entry, so to speak. The new uh, backup will use this one as its starting point. So that all works. Synthetic false, merging on the backend. We said, well, we have differencing, differencing VHDXs now. Uh, you can merge them and you can create synthetic fools. You can uh, let backups expire on that uh, side of the recovery storage that is all available and uh, implemented. And then restoring is basically the, the, the reverse. What you do is you have a production system. Oh my God, your virtual machine is gone. Well, you copy over your most recent backup. Whether this is... Uh, uh, a full backup or a differential backup doesn't really matter. The system is smart enough to know that it needs to pull the bits it doesn't have from uh, a previous copy, and it will just restore you a complete virtual machine that is brought online and you're up and running again. And as we mentioned, uh, you can create a new ID, but normally you will keep it because you're restoring a virtual machine uh, due to uh, a corruption or an accidental deletion or whatever. If it's in a lab, you might want to create a new ID or whatever, but in production, normally you don't. So it's all it's all in there. The SAN integration we talked about, uh, for the people that use SANs and like their SANs, and I'm one of them, I, I like all storage actually. So what we see here is we have a SAN and we have a Hyper-V server. So my virtual machine is running here, but my, my, my VHD, my base VGX lives on the LAN on the SAN, right? So I create a backup, same deal. I have my checkpoint, for my configuration, but I have my base VHD is actually created on my SAN LAN. What happens now is, well, I export the configuration, but hey, I keep my snapshot on my SAN and my backup is, is done. This one is deleted, it's converted into reference point, but I don't have to copy off the data to the, to the backup uh, storage immediately. So my backups can be very fast. We just skip that step. But as said, little warning, uh, your backups live at that moment in your SAN. So you have to make secondary copies one way or the other, or this is risky business. This is normally for, for short-term retention, but high frequency backups to be able to do them very fast and restore them very fast. It is not a replacement for the full backup cycle. That's what I always focus on when people want to do this. And again, restoring is the same, right? You just have to restore the exported configuration to the Hyper-V server. And basically you're running again because the, 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 the base VHD comes from the LAN snapshot and it's, and it's done, right? That, that's it. You're, you're golden already, which is kind of cool. If you if people use SANS, they get this process. If people have never played with SANS, uh, it might be a bit of a it might require an introduction into SANS storage management to to grab the concept. But basically, this is it. And that was a quick walkthrough because I have to talk a bit faster or move along a bit faster. Now I'm going to talk about some of the issues we've seen in 2016 and 2019 that uh, that you might run into. Now, we've talked about these reference IDs, and we've talked that they are kept in your VMCX files. Now, if you ever run into a scenario where you do a Hyper-V replica or, or replica via your backup software, and you do a lot of backups, and after months and months, you start seeing that your live migrations are slowing down significantly, or your, your boot times of a VM is very slow compared to what it used to be. It might be related to the fact that you have an issue with your backup software cleaning up your references IDs. You will see that those VMCX files might get very, very big, way too big, way bigger than normal. And that's what's causing this. So there is code, and it's WMI, to list the reference IDs in uh, a virtual machine VMCX file. And then you can see uh, how old they are and you might need to clean them out because they are old. If you see reference IDs there that are six months old and your retention time for your backups is like three weeks or, or whatever, uh, you know something is wrong. They're not being cleaned out and you are seeing your slow live migrations, your slow boot times. Okay, just check this out. The, this little reference scripts that you can uh, find on the internet, uh, 
it's all based actually on the original demo code from uh, Taylor Brown in uh, 2014 at uh, Tech at Europe. Uh, but it's adapted a bit. Why, it's, why is it adapted a bit? You want to list the times. You might want to exclude backups that are within your retention time. And based on this, you can decide to delete them. But there are. There, it's very easy to, to delete everything. But if you delete everything, you might break a process. If you delete, if you have problems with your backup software and you delete all the reference points, well, one, you're going to have to do a full backup again. But secondly, you might have broken Hyper-V replica because they all use recovery checkpoints and they all have their entries, right? So here we are excluding Hyper-V replica entries, and here we are playing with retention time. So the code is there. You can also find code code actually uh, on the uh, on the GitHub page of uh, Jaromir. Jaromir is a Microsoft uh, PFV who writes a lot of uh, sample scenarios, and he has one to explain RCT. So you can actually leverage his WMI code, which has improved over what Microsoft released. He's, he's taken the bugs out of it, so to speak, uh, to test and demonstrate for your understanding how how it all works. Now, in, in the real world, you will buy backup software. I have not seen people who implement WMI-only based scripts to do their backups. Maybe some small shops with a very uh, enthusiastic IT guy, but otherwise, you normally buy backup software. OK, but, to the next thing. Uh, RDMA, uh, let's let's uh, face it, if you are doing you using uh, S2D, if if you are uh, leveraging file shares as a target, this is uh, an opportunity to leverage RDME for your backups as well, because you have CPU offload, uh, and that's good. You get the same types of benefits you have from uh, a stand, uh, an off-host proxy, so to speak. You don't have that CPU load on your production uh, Hyper-V servers, because it's on the, on the NIC now. So that's kind of cool. If you have it, use it. So, if you use SMB3 file shares and they are not continuously available, you have a problem or a potential problem. Uh, I'm not going, going to go into the details, but what it boils down to is a non-high available SMB3 share is very optimistic about the data it's written. You could say it's cached. And it reports back to the backup software as the data is written, you're good. But something might go wrong. You might have a little glitch, you might have a network error, and some of the data is corrupted. But you've told your backup software things are good. So your backup software keeps going. And at restore time, uh, that little bit rot you, that was introduced, uh, well, it shows up and your back restores fail. So what you need to do is, uh, with SMB3, have very good quality material, and if possible, make it continuously available. Now, we have asked Microsoft to provide write-through for non-high available SMB3 shares, and they did, but you have to do it by mapping a drive letter or, or via net use, which is not really practical. You need to have this for UNC pods to integrate it with your backup software. And again, at the MVP summit this year, I will be lobbying for this because we have now seen that NFS has done it. So NFS is starting to offer this because they actually suffer from the same problem, but they fixed it. So I would really like Microsoft now to fix this as true. Small we caveat. Already, we are already two. <laughs> we, are we are already? Two people who uh, will ask. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and uh, a second caveat. If you enable write through, there is a performance drop, which is unavoidable. It's the price of having write through, right? Uh, but that's okay. Just scale your backup storage accordingly. You can measure it, you, you know what you need. So if you now are already suffering from too slow backup storage, making it uh, right through is only going to make it worse. So think about that before you do it. Uh, we have REFS version 3 support with Veeam and DPM, which means that, hey, you can have block cloning, which means uh, synthetic operations like synthetic full backups, uh, the transformations of backups uh, are very fast or a lot faster. It also means that if you uh, have integrity streams turned on, that you can discover a bit rot. You can see it in an event ID in your logs. But the good news is, if you're using a redundant form of storage spaces, you have auto recovery, auto repair. It will just detect it and it will say, hey, I have redundant copies of this data that I can't read. On the fly, under the hood, I will, will repair this for you and you will not be bothered with it. It will auto repair that. That is nice. 
So that's one of the, the benefits we like about REFS. And for example, this is a, a Veeam screenshot where this is being leveraged and there is a synthetic full backup being created with a fast clone, which is uh, an REFS operation. So that's how you know this one is running on REFS. And this is the event ID, event 133, that you will get if you have corruption on a file. And this is how you can detect. You can monitor that, and then you know you have corruption. But if you don't have storage spaces with redundancy, you have to fix it yourself. Or at least create a new full backup, so you at least have a, a complete good backup chain. Well, it's pretty cool things in REFS. Another new thing they introduced was virtual machine groups and collections, which basically allows you to group virtual machines, which is great for not just distributed application, but also for guest clusters, because in the end, that's a group of virtual machines. The, the groups can be across cluster nodes. You can create a checkpoint against such a group, and those uh, group checkpoints, so to speak, they can be exported. So why is this important? Well, this enables uh, guest cluster backups. So the, the way we used to do shared VHGX guest cluster backups, well, it's all wet. You had none of okay. these, no, yes? Sorry, there, there is a question. Um, someone is asking, sorry, but DBM still use 4K ReFS block size. Yes, yes. Um, well, yes, 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 well, well. Uh, and Veeam does as well, unless you change it. Yeah. So uh, you, it's, yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a choice. Uh, in the end, we uh, we mainly use Veeam. We've discovered and we have confirmed by Veeam use 64K. And Microsoft says use 64K as well. It's fine. But for that use case. So do not, to be supported by Microsoft and be 100% compliant if you do it for your Hyper-V workloads on your S2D or your SAN, you do not want to do 64K with REFS. Well, you don't want to do REFS on the SAN anyway. Uh, but for your backups, use 64K. Mm -hmm. Um, then I would ask, uh, you said the integra uh, integrity stream says um, when you have this self-detection of errors on ReFS, I yes. think you have to turn on integrity streams on the data, right? Yes, you have to. And it has a little perform. It has a little performance impact, of course. Yeah. And that's why you do it, for example, on the, on the, the backup. Uh, storage, but not on the Hyper-V storage. Mm -hmm. And you have to turn it on when you create the volume. You can't do it afterwards. So why creating a volume or virtual disk, we have to turn on the integrity stream. Yeah, I okay. think Veeam will do this, for example. It's integrated in the product. They, they will do it for you. Yeah. Then uh, Lee uh, is talking about VHD set backups do not work with DPM. Uh, and it, it yes, 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 yes. He's head of the game. I was going to mention that. Is a hell okay, of a game. Go on, so the work, the red stuff here is all the things you don't have, and you know what it is, right? You are used to having this, and then you don't have it, so you become a bit angry or at least grumpy. Which VHD said they addressed three of them. You still don't have storage live migration, or you cannot do standard or production checkpoints, but you do have your host level backup, you do have your online dynamic resize, and your Hyper-V replica support. So that's good. Too bad for these, they haven't been introduced in 2019. Too bad, but okay. This is the beauty, and everybody was very, very enthusiastic about it, really. Uh, there's a lot of requirements you need to read, and actually, I'm a bit disappointed that this hasn't gotten an entire chapter in Microsoft documentation where they explain it A to Z. You have to find the information all over the place, and even then, Unless you run into the issues, you might not even know that uh, you needed to look for something. So I've listed them up here for you. I'll leave it on the screen for a couple of seconds while I'll talk uh, because you don't have the slides. Uh, just take care of all this. And we will talk about a couple of the issues we've run into with this. So these are the easy ones to understand that each guest VM has to have the cluster feature installed. Of course, it's a guest cluster, let's let's be fair. But this one is a bit more concern, uh, concerning. Why must it be running? Why can't I create a, a guest cluster backup of a cluster where one node is down for maintenance or whatever? Uh, it's a bit of a question. Uh, the shared drives part of the backups have to be online, which is reasonable. I mean, if, if the disk is not available, you can't back it up. Uh, no CSVs inside of VHD set backups that is a given you cannot you cannot uh, leverage them that's a limitation and you have to live with that they all have to be on CSV sa uh, shares or SMB3 shares they have to be high available 
well, which is logical. It's a gas cluster. Why build a gas cluster on a non-high available uh, land, right? So you don't do that. This one we'll talk about in depth because it's it has caused a lot of issues for people. And yeah, the and the permission settings. This was probably the biggest cluster beep uh, they introduced with this feature, and we'll talk about that. So this is a VHD set. A, gas, a host based uh, gas cluster backup that is going well. I have my little two node cluster, it's backing up. I can see the Hyper V collection uh, recovery checkpoint being created. My hard disks are being backed up. I'm a happy camper, right? This is what I want to see. Uh, to make that work, uh, you have to create a path where the metadata of those. Uh, uh, recovery checkpoints for, for the collection are stored. And that is done with a PowerShell commandlet. And uh, that wasn't documented. Uh, Veeam has a backup, uh, let's say, knowledge base article about it. Microsoft has a little article about it. Uh, Veeam actually even does this for you or, or tells you to do so at the moment uh, you create, you add a cluster to your uh, backup environment because they want you to do it. Uh, which is nice, and people follow that advice, and that's what led to some problems. So first of all, you need to know uh, you have to create it, otherwise you will run into issues. This needs to exist. Uh, but once you've done that, from that aspect, you're good. There is one issue, however. That bot, once it has been set, cannot be changed. So if you put it somewhere on a CSV together with your, with your VMs and you change your mind, forget it. You cannot change it, uh, which is a bit annoying. Secondly, it's also annoying if you replace the storage behind your clusters and uh, you leave your Hyper-V clusters attached to your old SAN and you introduce the new SAN and you do a storage live migration, no downtime, everybody is happy. But of course, the new LUNs have to have another name. And if your shared storage pod was on uh, a LUN that you can't maintain, retain the name, you have a problem because, hey, uh, you have to get rid of it. You can't have two dual names. And afterwards, when you got rid of the old LUNs, you can't rename it because, well, <laughs> uh, problem here. You did a storage live migration of your VM, so they are now tied to that uh, bot. And secondly, it's impossible to change it. There is PowerShell will just throw an error. You can't, you, there, it's not in the GUI. So there is a, a solution for that. You, there's a Microsoft, uh, let's say, uh, support solution. And there's the scripted solution that I created because I ran into the issue and I wanted to test it out, how to fix it. So I've written a script and it's on my blog, the references in there, where you can just get the script and you can create this issues, issue and remove the issue. And because it's all based on registry editing, it, uh, helps, it helps minimize the downtime. So it will do all the editing and just at the last moment, bring down all the VMs, uh, rest stop and restart the cluster servers on all the nodes and then bring up the VMs for you. So it's a little automated uh, solution to deal with this. And I've come across a lot of people uh, across the globe that ran into issues because they couldn't change that storage part. So know that you can't change it uh, normally with PowerShell, but that there is a solution. Microsoft supported and the script, and they're both in the block. And normally you should never do this unless unless you involve Microsoft support. But of course, we don't always listen to those recommendations. And then the bad things. VHD set. I've shown you how it how it looks if it goes well. Well, this is how it can look if it goes wrong. Uh, it becomes a total mess. You will see that uh, checkpoints are not being cleaned up. And if you don't, but the backups are succeeding sometimes, but the checkpoints don't clean up. But you, you you accumulate a tremendous amount of checkpoints and then someday that, that backup will fail. And then you want to clean this up and you start investigating and you're in a mess because it's a VHD set. So how do you get out of this? Well, sometimes you're lucky. Sometimes if you shut down every node of the guest cluster, the merges start happening. Sometimes they don't, they start happening at, at when you start all the guest cluster VMs. Sometimes that doesn't even happen. You're stuck. Now what? Your backups don't work anymore. You have accumulated a lot of uh, checkpoints. What are you going to do? Well, 
uh, you could merge them manually. You could write the script to walk the, the dependency tree and do that for you, but that takes uh, downtime. All the older guest clusters have to be shut down to do that. Okay, but then you, if you do this successfully, you end up with a AVGX file where the data is inside, and if you and the data is in there because if you mount that, if you rename it to VHDX, you can you can look at it. So that's well done. But you have another problem: your VHD set is broken because the 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 the, the file, the metadata file that actually controls those AVGX files of a VHD set, that has lost its uh, its uh, it doesn't know what you did manually. It wasn't in charge of those operations. So the link is broken. That 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 VHD set will not boot, that, that this doesn't work. It can't do anything with it. You have a problem, so what do you need? Ah, you can convert, uh, you can rename this one, this AVHDX you created with all the data in there, you create, you rename it to VHDX, and then you convert it to a VHD set, but you have to do the conversion process. So if that's a large LUN, that takes a lot of time, and it's again downtime. And remember, the name of the game here is Clustering is for high availability, and this doesn't sound very well. Well, you have high availability, but you have backups that don't work, and you have a mess you need to clean up, and it all takes downtime. And basically, this is a bit like uh, brain surgery because you have another problem. What if you run into this in combination with your reference ID uh, problem that aren't cleaned up? You know that shared storage part we talked about? That's where the, the metadata goes. And well, if you if you have the if you have data in there that is not being cleaned out, because well your checkpoints are not being <laughs> being merged, you might think, okay, I'll merge my checkpoints manually and I'll delete the, the metadata in that uh, folder to get rid of it. But the reference IDs are still in the VMCX files, and then you get really funky behavior. Uh, and we'll we'll show you this. Now, what is the root cause of this behavior is the permissions on the folder where your shared disks and their checkpoints live of your guest cluster are incorrect by default. You have to fix it. There is a blog post about it, uh, and I've written a little script to do that for all the guest cluster nodes in your guest cluster. Because that's what you need to do from the get-go. If you forget this, you're in trouble. Basically, sooner or later, you are in trouble. So this is not a good experience, and this took almost a year for Microsoft to find and address and fix. And I think that is one of the reasons that so many people are disappointed with the quality of VHD set host level backups. And it might also explain why there is only one backup vendor in the world I found that even supports VHD set backups, and that's Veeam. I have not found any other that does. Not DPM, I think, not Comvault, not Altaro, not 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 any other. I haven't found one. And if you do know of one, please let me know because I would like to play with it. But again, here's the solution. Only caveat here is do it before you create a backup. Because otherwise, yeah, you're in trouble potentially from from, from day one. Uh, we've talked about that storage part thingy. Uh, right, and the the issues you could have with the phantom metadata and the phantom reference IDs in the VMCX files. Now you can clean this up. You can use a script to find them, but that becomes almost like brain surgery. If you thought uh, wading through uh, the VMCX files with WMI PowerShell was fun, wait until you have to do it for a guest cluster, because if you have references IDs that are not cleaned up and are referring to phantom metadata that you might have deleted, what do you see? Errors like this. The virtual machine migration operation uh, failed, right? Oh, you can't live migrate your virtual machines anymore. Oh, my virtual machine is not compatible with my physical computer anymore. Oh, the collection was not found on the virtual machine. All these things point to the same issues, what I just explained to you, but you, Virtual virtual live migra uh, virtual machine live migration breaks. Uh, you, you get compatibility errors. Uh, you're, you're in a bit of a quick mess, and you were just so happy because you you saved your 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 cluster backups by doing all those manual tedious downtime causing operations, and now, darn, <laughs> I still have problems. 
So it's not a pretty picture, and this entire process of gas clustering needs to be improved to make it popular again. Because I, I, I have helped more people get off PhD sets than I have helped people get on. Now, things are better because you know what the reason is and you can avoid it, but so many people don't know about it yet and have still run into issues uh, that it's a bit, it's, a, it's not a good story. This could have been so much better, right? And yeah, I've got a blog post on this one as well. The link is in there somewhere. I think the previous slide uh, here uh, or next one. Yes. Anyway, that's about it. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, ah, yeah, of course. Uh, I think I hit a slide in my deck that I'm seeing and you're not seeing, but that's okay. Uh, basically, that was in a nutshell uh, why Hyper-V went from a decent product to a very good product when it comes to backups. And we've discussed things that are still bothering us today. Now, this is not to say that that uh, Hyper-V backups are bad at all. And, and on the contrary, they are very good. Uh, if you if you compare, for example, the change block tracking mechanism versus some of the competitors, I, 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 I invite you to look at the issues they've had with change block tracking versus their competition. It is amazing how well of a job they did, actually, mm -hmm. over there. So overall, Hyper-V backups have never been as good as they have been today. But there are some very annoying caveats with newer technologies in Hyper-V that you need to be aware of and that I really would like Microsoft to fix and address to make it a, trans, uh, a happy experience from the start uh, so that people don't run into those issues anymore. So don't drop out yet. We have to an announcement for a new webinar. Uh, I take over, DJ, if that's okay. Yep. Can you click to the next slide, please? You have the, that's the slide there. So please, the next one. Um, because this is all, uh, I think, very important, and uh, it was a lot of theory in this uh, webinar. Uh, DJ and I, we will do a demoing Hyper-V backup and answering your questions, because there are more questions, and maybe you come up with more questions in two weeks. So uh, the, the webinar will be up, and then you get up the follow-up link, uh, the follow -up mail with the, the recording to get a link to the webinar and uh, maybe we can also show show some VHD uh, uh, VHD set things there yeah please the next slide uh, so we will have an English one again uh, at the same time it's on Friday the first uh, the 31st of January 11 a.m Central European time uh, the next one please um, we have the CD Germany coming up in May, and he is one of the presenters, uh, and he, he is uh, approachable during the conference, and even he will be there on the community day that is in front of the conference, and we have an early word still running up to the 31st of January. So if you are thinking to go uh, going uh, to this conference, uh, um, you can save 100 euros so far. You find the information at cdc uh, Maybe to uh, add, maybe to add, I'll be there and I'll be giving a presentation about the subject. Uh, and I had so many people contact me after my last presentation of this uh, uh, talk that uh, I've realized that a lot of people are running into these issues. So if you want to discuss what you're seeing and how to deal with it, as Karsten said, I'm there and I'm presenting on the subject. One of the presentations at least. And Didier loves to discuss. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, Lee, of course, the pre there are English-based uh, presentations, but there will be also Germany-based presentations. We have around 70 presentations. I would say nearly half of them are in English because the speakers are not uh, speaking German or don't want to, and the other half is German. But you will find enough interesting stuff there, and this conference the name is Cloud and Data Center Conference, but the data center part here should be in upper letters. So the focus is still on premises and not on the cloud. So we will have cloud content there around 30%, but the, the focus of the conference is still on premises uh, uh, solutions like Windows Server clustering, storage spaces direct. And if you go to the website, there is a link uh, to the past conferences and you can see all the 
um, all the presentations are available to uh, to watch them and also Didier's presentation about it. Go to the next slide, please. And this is the last one. Um, uh, we have an Hyper-V community uh, coming up uh, in Berlin, and there are still uh, free tickets available. So if you have time and want to go to Berlin on the 27th of January, um, we will have a Hyper-V community at the Dell EMC office. Uh, it's near the Tegel Airport. Uh, and we have seven, uh, seven presentations there, free uh, entrance. Uh, we will be we will have food and drinks. And if you are interested, go to hyper-v-community.tv. Hyper so uh, we uh, had a little bit of overtime. Thank you for your attendance. Um, the follow-up mail will come in the next days. Um, maybe I will get to it today or tomorrow. And you will see the recording of the uh, presentation. And uh, we will have another one at the end of January. So Didier, last words to you. Well, thank you for attending. I hope it was useful. So there's a lot of background information with links in the, in the presentation. So please go and uh, look at those. Uh, and now you know what to look out for to make your backup experience with, with Hyper-V and Windows Server 2016, 2019 uh, picture perfect, right? Yeah, and if you have questions about backup, please send them to me. I We will include them in the in the presentation of the in, at the end of the uh, month, my mail address is fee4carsten.rachfall at rachfall.de. You should have a mail from me already with the invitation. So please send me the mails. Uh, if you have questions, there are some. We can't handle them now about SQL guest clustering and uh, Hyper-V replica with VHD sets, but we will handle them uh, in the other presentation. So thanks again. Uh, have a nice weekend, have a nice Friday, and I hope we will see you soon. And also, something I didn't tell you, look at hyper-v-amigos.net. There are a lot of showcasts from uh, Didier and myself, and uh, we did a lot of backup showcasts about Beam, and uh, uh, you will also see storage spaces direct backup there, and storage spaces direct as a target, a single window server as a target for storage spaces, some good stuff. So bye-bye. Bye-bye.